later, but since we were talking about this, I just, as a Joshua Eaton parent, I want to commend Principal Sprung and the entire staff. Um, I've heard from students, and I've heard from parents, and I've heard from teachers. And what they did together as a community this week was really so well done. Students had a chance to share memories. Um, you talked about the, the bulletin boards and the things. I just, it's a very, very difficult time. It's a terrible, terrible tragedy. And speaking from all of the different people that I spoke to, everyone felt that they were all included and it was very well done and it was a nice tribute to a, a wonderful person. Thank you. Tonight's uh, meeting uh, will, will uh, doesn't look like we have any public input, so uh, we'll uh, move to the uh, consent agenda. Does anybody uh, have anything they'd like to have removed from the consent agenda? No. Mr. Chair, move to yeah. approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? I have zero. Oh, I'd also uh, like to say that uh, uh, Dr. Nyan is uh, recovering uh, from surgery uh, that went well, uh, and you know we expect to have him back here in probably a couple of weeks or so. So he said right after uh, Martin Luther King Day. Right. So that's great. We wish him well and a speedy recovery. Next, we would have the uh, uh, reports and uh, the student and committee reports. Stocksfield. Human Relations Advisory Committee is going on as we speak at the town at um, the police station. The um, Martin Luther King Day event is on Monday, January 18th, from 9:30 to 11:30. Please come. Breakfast is free, and organizations. School and local organizations will be talking about how they're taking care of others, as Martin Luther King charged us to do. And um, there will be lots of community and um, school involvement in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. What? Thank you, Chairman Robinson. I, I had asked if I could um, just take a few minutes to read a few highlights from the article that was in the Globe on Wednesday. Um, which was actually front page above the fold, social emotional growth high on the curriculum. So um, I really was, I want to thank, uh, really, the thanks goes to our whole community, but specifically to the schools, Dr. Darty, uh, Sarah Burge, <coughs> our <coughs> superintendent, the really all the administrators. So I don't know if people actually had an opportunity to read it in print. Um, but across Massachusetts, schools are devoting more time to address social emotional well-being of their students. Educators stress the movement is not simply a feel-good education. They say teaching students at every grade to manage their emotions can help them deal with a multitude of serious illnesses, including bullying, bullying mental illness, substance abuse, or trauma. So right in line with what we're, we just talked about. Um, so Reading is a town of 25,000 north of Boston, has emerged as a state leader over the past few years in what is, what is known as social emotional learning. Um, the town stands apart because it has devised an aggressive plan to reach out to students before signs of problems arise, and its initiatives go well beyond the school doors. Um, so I'm just reading certain episodes. These don't all flow together. Uh, and a quote from Sarah Bird was that you treat every child as if they need a safe and supportive environment and that every child, you don't know which children need that because they don't wear a name tag, so you really have to make it an environment for every child. Educators stress it's a challenging undertaking because it's not always clear which students are experiencing distress. Some may signal that they are struggling by acting out in class or bursting into tears, but others can appear, appear well adjusted. In one noteworthy endeavor, the town, Reading, is training more than 350 educators, town librarians, clergy, crossing guards, bus drivers, and police to be youth mental health first aid responders, instilling them with the skills to identify students who might be in trouble and know how to respond. While with, with Reading ranking almost at the bottom in the state for per student spending, the town has relied on three federal grants totaling about two million to help support our social and emotional programs 
in school and its community-wide efforts to combat substance abuse among residents of all ages. I just want to add, you know, we know that there are a lot of people who work really, really hard to get those grants and that's, you know, across the, our community, the police, La Casa, the schools. So that's a really important piece of it because clearly we, we would definitely not be able to do that. The community dialogue was a natural outgrowth of an effort that the town began a decade ago. And I think many of us were involved in some of those um, World Cafe type conversations. Uh, the race to nowhere, a lot of the things that we've done in the community. Um, school officials also undertook a review at that time and concluded the district lacked a comprehensive approach to fostering social and emotional well-being. So the findings prompted the school officials to do an overhaul, and the overhaul appears to be paying off in a report this fall, the, Re uh, the Rennie Center, an education research and policy organization in Boston, highlighted Reading along with Fall River and Gardner as glowing examples of their work in student behavioral health, specifically because they made it a, com a community effort rather than just a school initiative. So I think this is just a great, <coughs> great article. And this is part of a series of articles that the Globe is doing all year around education. So probably something to look for in Wednesday's papers. Uh, but I just really wanted to take a minute to highlight a few things. The article's long. I recommend reading the whole thing. And really just want to thank uh, the administration and staff for their leadership and really the leadership in the, in the community <coughs> in La Casa. So thank you. Thank you. And, and Dr. Doherty just passed around. The, that's the full article. Um, just two things. We have two <coughs> special ed parent advisory council meetings, full meetings this <coughs> month. Um, on January 12th, we have our basic rights presentation. So we have someone coming from Mass Advocates for Children to do a basic rights presentation for the parents. And on January 28th, we have a meeting where I'll be going over our new transition process for students moving from different levels, so preschool to kindergarten, um, elementary to middle, and middle to high school, and how we're going to work to transition our special education students and families. Um, so those are those two meetings. And then the post program, they are officially moving in um, on Monday, so they've been doing transition this week oh, yeah. out of our space here. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll be in their space in Wakefield on Monday. And if any of you are interested in going for a final tour, because I haven't yet to see the space, I'm happy to, um, you know, coordinate something. So, uh, but yes, I believe Monday will be the day. Greg, Dr. Doherty. I know we're not talking about budget tonight, but um, we. We had, we've sent out several notices to the community about bu upcoming budget meetings, and we sent another one out today in anticipation if anyone thought that we were going to be talking about budget tonight. Um, so we will be starting the budget presentations to the school committee on Monday night. On Tuesday and Wednesday night, we're going to do a presentation for the actual entire school community. Uh, we're going to have uh, babysitting service provided if, if parents want to bring the children, and we'll have, we'll have kids babysitting um, if they need to. Um, but we'll be doing the same presentation two nights in a row. It uh, gives people the opportunity to see both. Uh, Tuesday night is at 6.30 at Coolidge, and Wednesday night is at 6.30 at Parker. And there'll be the same presentation. It, which will be the one we see Monday That you see night. on Monday night, <coughs> correct. Um, the Board of Selectmen are also starting their budget discussions, and I had sent that out to you on, it's the next two Tuesdays. and. I know the town manager has encouraged the Board of Selectmen to come to the school committee meetings, and so if, if people want to go to the Board of Selectmen's meeting, I know the facilities budget um, will be discussed on Tuesday night, mm -hmm. and that will involve schools, so. Tuesday the 12th. This, this Tuesday the 12th, and yes. And then also the 19th. And the 19th is the rest of the budget areas. Yes. And those are also at the senior center, not at the town hall. They're at the senior center. Thank you. Yes. Board and the new chief will be pinned also on, on Tuesday, Tuesday night. Tuesday correct. night, right? Gotta go to that. Yeah. So that's is that it. it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you uh, now we can uh, do the Parker Middle School search. Principal. Search. Yes. So in your packet 
is the the timeline and the for the search and the composition of the search committee. Um, search committee is is pretty much been put together now. Um, applications are coming in. We have a I believe 20 applications right now, and the deadline is the 22nd. Um, so the screening committee will start meeting next week to um, design questions, um, to start reviewing the applications, to, um, and they'll be conducting interviews in early February. The goal is to, um, once the, the pre-finalists are chosen, and, and then I'll have um, interviews with the pre-finalists and um, then move forward the finalists, which will then become public, we will um, then have open microphone sessions and site visits to Parker and potentially site visits to the, to the schools, their schools, um, which we sometimes do, we sometimes don't do, depending on the situation. Um, the goal is to have a Parker Middle School principal appointed by um, March, in March. Um, which for, for a July 1 start. I do. Move to approve the Parker principal, principal search process and timeline as presented. Is there a sec? second? Second. Any comments? Questions? Okay. Just, yes. Just a very brief <coughs> um, Before I served on the school committee, I was a parent representative on a different search process, and I found it to be uh, just, it's hard to know because there's anonymity so to protect the candidates, so you can't really talk about it afterwards. So this sort of like, how does it go? And I just wanted to say, I think it's a phenomenal process. It's very inclusive. It's very open. People are very honest. There's a lot of good discussion. Um, and in, in sort of talking with other school committees across the state, this really is a model. This is mm. how it should be done. So I, I'm very proud of this process, and I think it's yielded good results. So kudos to Dr. Doherty and the staff for developing this. It really, I do think it should be the model for the state. Yes. Same question. Um, I also have been a part of this process and have um, felt the strength of it. I really think it's an important process that takes extra effort but is worth every minute of it, of all of the people's time. Um, I see that it's been listed in the Boston Globe School Spring Mass MASPA Monster. Our, I know we've discussed in the past trying to reach out to draw in a diverse candidate pool. Can you tell me? I'm not really well versed in these. Is this, um, will this draw in um, people from different cultures and different, I mean, yes. a diverse uh, Well, school spring, school spring and Monster definitely, it will, it will go out to a diverse uh, pool of candidates. Um, we also, um, I believe also Michelle Lassonde has reached out to uh, universities as well. Um, so it, it does, it does reach out to a diverse Thank pool. You. Yeah. I yes. one question. So in terms of the timing of the transition, is there, would there be any planned overlap between the current principal and the new principal? So having it appointed in March gives you the flexibility to allow that person to come in mm -hmm. a couple of days here and there during the school year. So that they they can start transitioning. It doesn't mean that they would be starting right, right. at that time. It's a July first start, but they would they would have the ability to come in and see how the end of the school year runs and right. And our current principal is a June thirtieth contract. Yeah. Yep. Okay. She's there till June thirtieth. Okay. So there's no wouldn't be necessarily any plan to like extend that at any point in time, but hopefully leverage if some of that time. If it's if it's necessary, we can. But I don't think yeah. it'll be necessary as as long as we're able to appoint someone in March. But in, I mean, there's all likelihood that person will have another job until June 30th. Right, but we we've, we've worked it out with other school districts. I'll, I'll talk to the <coughs> superintendent and say, you know, can we have? And, and sometimes what happens is we we trade days, so we may need them to come in a few days before they start, and they may need to stay a few days in their school district after they start. So there's a trading of days that happens to allow for the transition on both ends because they're transitioning out of their school district as well. Thank you. Ready for the vote? All those in favor? Five zero. Okay, uh, appointment to collaboratives.
Yes, Mr. Chair, move to appoint Superintendent John F. Doherty as the Reading Public Schools representative to the Board of Directors of the North Shore Education Consortium for the 2015-16 school year. Is there a second? Did, did you have a... This is an annual appointment by statute that the school committee needs to take a vote on. Any other dis questions, discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. Mr. Chair, move to appoint Superintendent John F. Doherty as the Reading Public Schools representative to the Board of Directors of the SEAM Collaborative for the 2015-16 school year. <coughs> Second. Second. Any discussion? None. You ready to vote? Five zero. Ready for the uh, budget transfer discussion? Sure. So we're um, we're midway through the year, and um, we we've had some hiccups in a couple of our cost centers that we didn't budget for. Um, the first one that I'll talk us through is the technology cost center. Um, we had um, a number of things that we have to uh, we have to fund. Um, there was a staff turnover, and during that time, um, we contracted with a, a consultant to help keep the system up and running, um, and keep our infrastructure and our networks and other things up and running. Um, we had to uh, buy out that the person that left their vacation, um, and the, the, the candidate that we selected to replace him uh, came in at a slightly higher salary, annual salary. Um, so at this point in the year, we're we're under we're in a deficit situation of just under forty thousand um, dollars. I'd like to give us a little bit of wiggle room for the rest of the year. So I'm requesting a transfer of forty five thousand dollars from the regular education cost center. Um, we do have some salary savings from turnover in regular ed that we're going to use to um, to fund this and the second cost the second transfer that we're requesting. Um, I don't know. If, uh, I'll stop if you have any questions about the first technology. Yes. Um, does the FY17 budget that we're going to start looking at next week, next week account for these increases? Yes, it Great. does. Thank you. It does. Thank you for the question. Any others? Um, the second transfer is to the administration cost center. Um, we have we're covering a, a leave of absence for a, a staff person that had a mater had a child, and so we need to cover that absence as it's a critical position, and it wasn't one that could be absorbed by existing staff. Um, and that, that's the most significant part of that one. Um, the other portion there is we're, we're slightly ahead of budget when it comes to employee physicals, where we are at this point in the year. And I think that's a direct result of the, the large turnover that we had last year. Um, those, the people that we were onboarding hit this year's fiscal budget. So, um, so we're a little bit, at, at this point in the year, we used all of our physical money, which I know we're gonna have more hires between now and the end of the year. So um, at this point, we're about $18,000 in the deficit in the administrative cost center. So I'm requesting a $20,000 transfer, again, from the regular ed cost center to, um, to bring that one into, uh, into balance. Yes. I have a question. I guess I probably should know this because it's been so long, but so we, we have to pay the cost of physicals for employees as they yes. start? Um, the Board of Selectmen, uh, it's, a, it's a requirement that, that a we have a physical, a pre-placement physical. It's a town of Reading requirement. Town of Reading requirement. So even if they, like, just have an annual physical at their doctors, you can't get the, you don't take that, you, we make them see some other doctor? <coughs> <I'm> sorry. <coughs> no, I apologize. The town of Reading has contracted with Quadrant, um, and that's where we do all of our pre-placement physicals. And if there's anyone who's injured on the job, they go to quadrant to be looked at if there's a, a work there's also injury. There's also screening yeah. as well okay. that okay. goes along with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And we pay for that. Yes. Yes. I, I feel, I, how, how is the, I'm assuming that whatever the results of a physical are confidential. I feel funny asking this question. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. it's just yeah. for the employee's benefit that there is this physical and a baseline so that if down the road something. It's good risk happens. management. The, the, yeah. Yes, exactly. The, the confidential results are provided to our HR administrator and, um, and determinations are made if, if, if anything is, anything a yeah, positive. Yeah, we also, you know. when we get the screening results too. Yeah. 
And, and our offer letters are contingent upon successful um, physical, pre-placement physical, if you will. Yeah, I guess in, I mean, some of my workplaces, you, people just have to go to their own doctors and get certain, you know, they go, we, they give them a slip and you get the testing, but this is, gives you a, a different level of control. I understand why the town wants to do it. I just was not familiar with it. So I don't know what they cost per person, but they're probably a few hundred bucks, I'm assuming. Mm. It, 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 it has an impact on our uh, health insurance, con you know, with Maya. Uh, My guess is we do get a discount yeah, because so we do this. this yeah. is um, good, good policy, business. Mm -hmm. good yeah. business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I just ask, I, I'm really new to this piece. So if something were discovered, then what would then be the step of the school commit, the, the um, schools, the HR, and the prospective employee? Do you want me to speak to that or do you want to? Um, so, I mean, there are, some, there are some things that whatever is discovered is, is in affect their employment here. There are other things that, that could be. So for, and, and I'll just give you an example. If someone fails the alcohol and drug test and they're working with kids, then we have to think about, do, is that the person that we would want in the school district? And we, we do have the right to deny them based on that. Because that's in the contract that they sign when they say they're going to do this, they're going to get that physical or... It's it says the it's based yeah. upon, their, it's their the hiring is, is contingent upon the mm -hmm. pre-employment physical that's pretty and screenings. Right, I think that's all pretty standard. I just think um, the fact that the municipality pays for it is a little different than maybe some private industries, but I can understand that it gives us a better um, RIC position with uh, the insurance raters, mm -hmm. and it's a good protector. Thank you. Just, yes. just to yeah. reconfirm, these, so these costs and the transfers, the money is there because of staff turnover exactly so, so if we're not yes. looking for additional funds correct just the it's, it's a it's a reallocation I um, the way the budget is approved by the school committee we, we have the purview to move things within a cost center but I can't move between. savings between cost centers without the school committee's approval so Can we read the motion? oh I'm so sorry Move to authorize the transfer of $45,000 from the regular education cost center to the technology cost center. Can we do this all in one? And move to authorize the transfer yeah. of $20,000 from the regular education cost center to the administration cost center. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, 5-0. Dr. Daugherty, did you want to do your goals? Sure. Um, so in your packet, uh, you see uh, the well. There's a, there's a couple of things in the in the what I want to uh, share with you. Actually, is this in here? Yeah. In the back. What's that? In the back. Yeah. Yeah, but the goals aren't in there. Superintendent goals. On in here. But I can talk about the district planning process while we're waiting. <laughs> um, so um, the goals, the actual <coughs> goals have not changed since last year. But what has changed is the process that we used to create the actual action planning. And we actually came across this, this process a year ago at the MASC MASS conference that the DESE was, was piloting this new process in some, some school districts. Um, the planning for success process. So as a, as a district leadership team, we em embarked on this process this past year and came up with um, a series of six action plans for the five goals. Um, and so the five goals, if you remember, one is teaching and learning, one is building the professional capacity, one is the social emotional learning of students, one is resources and space, and one is communication. So we developed individual action plans for those. We took the teaching and learning one and actually split it into three. So we have one for curriculum and assessment and instruction because we felt that just having one goal on that was too overwhelming. So what the action planning does, and I think it was in the December packet, it's 
not in this one, but it was in the December packet, is it creates specific steps for the year, and maybe a little bit beyond the year, on what are the action steps that you're taking, who was responsible for that, and then the early benchmarks of success, how do you know it's working? And that's what's captured in, in each of the action plans. Um, in this past November at the MASC, MASS conference, um, we had the opportunity along with several other school districts to present um, at the conference on this process. And in the packet, I know this is in the packet, um, there is, the Reading story is, is in here. Um, it's like it's, it's marked as page 24. So they have a whole case study on us, which is on the, the DESE website um, in the process that we used um, as we went through creating the, the separate action plans for each of the, the five goals. Um, so that, that's in here, um, as you can see. I apologize that it's the action plans in it. Uh, in the packet, but I think I think it was in the December one that you received. Did anyone have any questions? So can I just ask so who participated in this process that the case study was written on? Um, so the way that we did it is we went through a series of trainings. The the district leadership team went through a series of trainings with a facilitator from the Department of Education during the school year. Okay to come up with the different action plans. Okay. And then this past summer, we spent a lot of time, we actually took a, a stop in March because we wanted, we wanted to do it right, so we wanted the summer, since it's less <coughs> hectic, yeah. a summer, the summer to reflect on it and really come up with some really strong action steps. So at the beginning of the summer, we developed the action plans and then in August, we brought everyone back together and included assistant principals, team chairs, central office administrators, principals as part of that to refine in the, um, the action plans. By your uh, comment here that you thought one of the things that helped that be effective was to have the external facilitator. Yes. Yeah. Um, because the external facilitator allowed myself to participate um, and other central office administrators to be part of the, the conversations. Whereas if one of us was facilitating it, that wouldn't have been as easy to do. No, I think that's a good, really good point. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry, no, I'm not asking questions. Um, it, I, I believe she's running. Yes, yeah, she is. So I apologize for that. No, I didn't catch it. <coughs> oh, yeah, you said it. There yeah. it is. Sorry. It was in the December last package. meeting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is that the same as what was in last, the 21st? Yeah, that hasn't changed. Yeah. What we'll be doing. Um, once the budget season is over with the district leadership team is we'll be going and refining each of these action steps to make sure we're still on target. Um, so let me, I'll quickly now go through it. So the, the first page is the one page snapshot of our, our vision, our theory of action, our questions that we ask, the five goals and the progress of the, um, the sub goals underneath. And then when you look at, um, the chart on page three, you see the district goal, the action plans that are aligned with that goal, and then the strategic objectives that are aligned to those action plans and district goal. And then when, on page, starting on page four, you have the district goal, so um, goal number one, student learning. The first action plan is curriculum, and then you see all of these different process benchmarks, things that are going to be happening, the person responsible, the date, and then the status of each of these. Um, 
So in mid-January, we'll start going through this with the DLT, the district leadership team, and review and revise if we need to each of these action um, action plans. So it's a we felt there was a much cleaner way in a much more focused way. That's what we found as we were doing the process that we were much more focused than the old system that we were using. The other thing is is that the, the principals are using this template for their school improvement plans also. Yes. Uh, just wanted to comment, John, I really like the way that this is all broken down. Um, I was just having this discussion at Parker about the school improvement plans and I think it's very difficult to, to um, really track the specific progress by breaking it down you know, with all of these individual categories, I think it's a great way to show what the progress that's been made. You know, the specific examples as opposed to just a general blanket statement, this shows what's been done specifically and I think this is very well done, very well thought out. Yes. I have a question, I, I agree with that completely actually, everything that uh, Mrs. Choice just said, I like how it's laid out and I like the accountability piece um, and I like the dates. A, a question I'm having as I'm flipping through it is the measurement, so how do you know I'm seeing a lot of inputs. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. So I'm looking under the sections early evidence of change benchmark. Right. Is that where I should be looking? That's some of your measurements. And then if you go in the back, the back page. So the back page are more of the common measures. And it's gonna look a little bit different for each school <coughs> based on where they are at with their goals um, in their school improvement plans and in the district. So. These are the 13 areas that we're looking at as common measures. Not everyone is doing all 13. Mm -hmm. um, so principals, um, depending on their school, they'll have some of these 13, depending on the goals they're focused on. Um, <coughs> the district leader of social emotional <coughs> has Sarah Bird. The team chairs have certain common measures that they're focused on. And then central office has, has other ones. Um, so this is what we're, those are the measures I think you're talking about. So if you go to page, oh, I'm sorry, you? Um, can I ask a quick clarifying yeah. question, Mr. Chair? Thank you. Um, so this replaces then the process we went through last fall where we came up with a very similar, I think they were called superintendent's goals at that time. This is your district action plan. Okay. Which these are essentially the superintendent's goals. So the superintendent's goals come from the di district action plan. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So if you go to page five, it may just be a housekeeping thing, but we should probably have where Doug Lyons is listed as a person responsible. We should probably, uh, there must be someone new taking that. Oh, over. yes, I see what you're saying, yes, yep. With like, for yep. instance, with Heather Thank Leonard. Thank you. So is Heather Leonard doing his role? She's doing, was doing it with him. Uh, yeah, I'm she does. Oh, right. So it's it's right now. It's Jane. It is okay. Yeah, it's Jane. And those are the changes that we're gonna in mid January when we review it. Okay. Any other questions? And you'll see these also on Monday, not all of this, but you'll see these on Monday night because really this is how you develop your budget because you want to link it to the goals. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, did you have a, or did you just? No, I was just scratching my head. <laughs> okay, now we'll have the uh, <coughs> second, second reading of uh, policy BEDH public participation at school committee meetings. Should I start reading? Yes. Okay. Um, policy BEDH public comment at school committee meetings. All regular and special meetings of the school committee shall be open to the public. All school committee meetings, including executive sessions, are conducted in accordance with the Massachusetts open meeting law. The school committee desires. Yes. Can I um, move that we get started with the reading for now since it's in the packet? Yes. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor and defense of the reading? Uh, Mr. Chair, move to accept the second reading and approve the revised policy BEDH public participation at school committee meetings. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Second, second, and then we can have a discussion. Yeah. I second. Okay. I just uh, just before we start, uh, I we got some emails on this, and I guess 
just some comment on that. I mean, we've always had a policy on this, uh, and at least speaking for myself, uh, I would never uh, put the gavel down and tell someone they only had three minutes to speak or whatever to speak and let people speak. And, and certainly, if a topic is, uh, you know, going on uh, longer than the 15 minutes, and there's still some some valid discussion to have. I'm all for continuing that. I think this just sets a guideline, really, to set the agenda for the evening. It doesn't. It's not. It can always be flexible at that any given point in time. And I'm, you know, hoping that any committee that's sitting here down the road would feel the same way. Uh, there's certainly no intention to uh, stop people from voicing their opinions or uh, or other uh, comments they have. Uh, one of the other uh, comments that came out was that uh, there there is potentially a concern with people that or residents that can't speak to an, a matter that's later in the evening during the public input section. I guess, you know, I'd be flexible in that, too, if someone came up and said, I can't be here for such and such, but I'd like to speak to it. Now, I'm, I'm perfectly, perfectly fine with that. Uh, I don't need, don't think that that needs to be written into the policy, though. I think it's just a matter of uh, a good way of treating people and how you run a meeting. Uh, so uh, that's, I guess, my comment on the, on the evening. Did you? Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say one of the other concerns was that if people came, like you mentioned, they might not be able to stay the whole time, but if they are able to, the goal of streamlining the meeting so that if someone has a comment on something that is going to be on the agenda, it behooves the understanding of the issue and the discussion if they speak on that at the time that it's being considered by the school committee um, as opposed to being stated at the beginning of the meeting disjoint from when the discussion happens and that was the goal is just to integrate the discussion if there's an issue that's already on the agenda mm -hmm. to integrate that and it was pointed out also that in terms of people's expectations if they come at a time to our meeting, we had talked during our district governance meetings that we wanted to have our meetings more predictable. If we've said that that discussion is going to happen at a certain time in the meeting, then it's important that people can expect that's when it's going to happen. Um, another one of the comments was um, that we read in our emails was about interruptions for executive session. And our goal with this policy was to set up the expe expectation that we would follow our agenda, but sometimes there are times when we're paying a consultant for executive session or something when we need to interrupt. But I'd like to just, I guess my opinion is that we would try to respect the time of the public that comes here and try it all, if at all possible, to plan our consultants around the public input time so that we don't keep people waiting. So that the executive session is either at the beginning or the end of the meeting and not, I mean, that, that's, that has yeah, happened, yeah. but it's, it's been rare. Uh, but I, I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Yes. Oh, I, I guess I just want to say, I mean, this is <coughs> going, on, it's going on like 13 years on the committee, so uh, probably you, but the, we've always had the public input and at various times had informational things available to people on the on what the protocol is and the whole idea behind this is just to give people an opportunity to understand how they can interact with us in a, a productive way and to just set some guidelines for how we're going to be respectful to people I think over all the years that I've been on the committee I I think you know we've done our best to be respectful there have been I think a couple of times in the last year where we have had, you know, an executive session, maybe that's sort of been in the middle due to due to timing. We have to bring other people in, the town manager or whomever, and, you know, so we, we have to, to do that. Generally, we try to, those are planned on the agenda um, in advance of the meeting. So, uh, you know, hopefully people will 
see this as an opportunity to just provide a, a way for us to be respectful of the community and invite them in. So. Yes. Um, the other question, thank you. The other question that was raised was about um, when the agenda booklets are available. And they are available to the best of the office's ability. The agenda for the meeting is published the required two days in advance. But all the supplemental information um, isn't always available to be given out at the same time. And although um, all of us would love as much time as we can have, um, it's not always possible to get that information out as early as uh, ideal, as is ideal. Um, but I just wanted to say I think it's awesome that people are looking and interested and becoming educated and involved, and I think that's a really great thing. So that was also what our policy wanted to indicate, is that we invite people to be involved and we wanted to be predictable that way so people know what to expect. And there will be a brochure coming and a booklet coming, but they're not done yet. <laughs> I agree. So, yes. I think that also too, it's important to, to reiterate that the policy hasn't changed. This, we've always had this policy and town meeting follows the same policy where there's discussion with the town meeting members, with this, the school committee members, and then the general public is invited and, and absolutely welcome. And I would like to say the more the merrier. I'd like to see more people here and I'd like to see more discussion and input. Um, and and I, I do feel that you know we do our, our very best to make people feel welcome and, and to have their voices heard. But we're, we're just, we're not changing the policy that's been in place for years. Yes. I'm sorry, another question that was asked about where you can find these policies to make, to become aware, and they're on the school committee page, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, on the right hand side, so you can see what the current policies are, and at our different distance, district governance meetings, we also um, decided that we wanted to be going through, renewed our pledge to go through these policies over time, so that we would all be, because people are newly elected, so we'd all be aware of what our policies are and on the same page, along with the public. And um, in terms of the public, one of our goals is so that people can be informed. Um, RCTV, thank you very much, RCTV, for the time and effort you put into taping our meetings so that people can find our meetings and also come up to speed, even if they can't make it to us. So we encourage people to share that information and to watch. Yes. Things. Thanks for all um, diving in. Um, a, a question that I heard this raised some interesting discussion in the community was, well, what if I can't go to a school committee meeting? I can't get a babysitter or I'm busy that night. And um, public comment is one of many ways that people can talk to this committee. It's one way. Um, office hours is another if they want you know, something a little bit more um, private and smaller. And um, email is a very easy way. If you email all members of the school committee, you can, you can very carefully craft your input, and we get it. So that's, there are multiple channels through which to communicate with us, and, um, and I share everyone's agreement that it's vital that we, that we strive to get as much input from the community to make the best decisions we can. And if someone wants to send that email and says that they want to read it public input, we can do that Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Yes. I just wanted to clarify the expectation to the policy of the school committee is that when we do get a group email or when anyone gets an email that we share that with the chair and with the superintendent so that the chair can reply. So when we get our emails, we can do research, we can think about it, and we can um, communicate with the chair. And the chair will probably be, will, by policy, the chair will be the one that replies to those emails just so people understand what the procedure is. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor, second reading. Five zero. We have minutes. They no, were the consent agenda. Consent agenda. Oh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's sweet. So I love that. Is there any uh, any other business that anyone would like to bring up? Motion, 
move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See everybody Monday night. Monday night. Going down the history books.